Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am Game Master Bloodworth, and as you can see by the graphics, uh, today's video, uh, I am making my return to coverage of Fallout, the RPG. Uh, I'll be focusing on Chapter 2, The Combat System. Uh, and this is Episode 3 in the series that I've been doing, uh, breaking down the game system and the core book of Fallout RPG. Uh, so, if you're not aware, this is a Modifius uh, IP. Uh, they, they share this IP with Bethesda, which is the, you know, the game company that uh, owns the IP as well. And you're, you're getting a, a really unique combination of uh, both, both forms of media coming to, uh, you know, you know, coming to your table when you are uh, running this game or playing this game uh, because you can very, very easily see the connection between uh, Fallout 4, uh, the computer RPG, and what they're looking to do with this tabletop role-playing game. So, without further ado, I am going to jump right into Fallout RPG Chapter 2, the combat system. I'll see how far I actually get through this. Uh, I might decide to split it after, um, you know, after damage and injury and then save healing and environment later or whatnot. I'll see how long it actually goes. I'd like to try to keep this around 20 minutes or so um, for your viewing pleasure. Um, I know that sometimes these can run long and I think it's better to chunk it down just for your convenience. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. So here we have the combat system, and uh, I am going to go right here and talk about initiative. Now, I'm not going to read word for word every single thing you see on here. You're certainly welcome to do so. Uh, that's why I make it large so that you can see. But the sequence of play is the initiative of combat, then initiative, then taking turns, and then beginning a new round. So initiative, and this is really unique. I, I like this approach to it. Uh, when combat begins, the player who initiated the combat takes a turn immediately. Once this is done, the Game Master ranks the combatants in order of their initiative statistic from higher to lower, and the first round begins. All right, so in this instance, what they're talking about is, is that you're not going to see, well, well, who has the highest, you know, who has the highest rank of initiative um, and then go from there all the time. And you're not ra rolling a random die to, um, to generate initiative either. <coughs> it's kind of a, a more focused in on actual role playing. Like who was the one that initiated combat? That individual or entity, because the game master could be the one controlling NPCs that initiated combat first as well. Um, that's going to determine who goes first. And then the highest rank of initiative statistic goes into play. So your character's initiative is equal to their perception plus their agility plus any bonuses from equipment or perks. So every player should have a notation on their uh, character sheet or, you know, an index card, whatever, their notes uh, that has this number already ready to show, all right, uh, and visible to all else at the table. So you don't have to quibble, oh, well, who's going to go next or whatnot. It's already on there. Um, if I were using a BTT, I would actually uh, create a little text that, uh, you know, that is on the side of the uh, panel so that everyone can see what is the initiative order here. Creature NPCs initiative is equal to their body plus their mind. Uh, and that's another thing that I like about this. They're putting in that perception uh, or mind as part of the uh, calculation for initiative because it's not just how fast your body moves in giving you an advantage of initiative, it's how quickly your mind moves as well. And so I really like that. And, and in the 
in the instance of player characters, it's their perception. It's how aware they are as a character to what is going on. Um, now, how aware they are as a player, where that comes into play is, um, is in that initial who gets to go first, all right? Because if that is the character that acts first, then that sets the tone from there. And then it goes to the next highest in that particular order. This also means that the, the NPCs controlled by the Game Master might be in the mix in there as well. So we're not using side initiative here, we're using initiative on an individual basis, which I also like. Now that's not unique to this system, but, um, but I like so far as a combination how this system is doing initiative. Uh, a character's NPC's initiative is calculated the same as player characters, though some powerful NPCs add bonuses. All right, so yeah, so if you're controlling uh, a, an NPC then um, as a player character, then that player character functions with the same, um, with the same as your, your player character. Actions. So you can attempt one major action and one minor action on your turn in combat. So minor actions are uh, taking aim and you roll a d20 on the first attack roll, you make this turn, all right? Um, drawing an item, uh, that means like drawing a sword or you know drawing your weapon or whatnot. Uh, you interacting with your equipment or environment in some simple way, uh, like opening a door or pushing a button. Movement, a movement action, move up to one zone to any position within medium range, alternately stand up from a prone position. Uh, taking a chemical, so uh, administering a dose of a chem at, uh, that you are holding, targeting yourself or a willing character within your reach. If you're not holding the chem, then you need to draw it first and then, so it would take you um, an additional action round in order to actually administer it, or you'd have to use your major action in order to do that. Spending luck to act, act faster. So you can also spend luck points to interrupt the normal initiative order and take your turn earlier in the round. You must do this at the end of another character's turn, but before your turn in the initiative order. You cannot interrupt another player while it is their turn. Once you have taken your turn, you do not take another or uh, at your own normal point in the initiative order until the next round. All right, so when you spend a luck point to take your turn earlier, you take your turn immediately. Can take one minor and one major action as normal and can spend action points to take additional actions as normal. You are still limited to the number of actions you can take in a round and can be interrupted by a ready action as normal. Uh, prone, if you're knocked down by an attack, hazard, or complications, you may also drop prone willingly at the end of any movement action you perform. Being prone has the following effects. When you are prone, you crawl, the movement action becomes a major action. Other than a minor action, you cannot take the sprint action. While you're prone, enemies at medium range are farther at plus one to the difficulty of their attacks against you. While prone, enemies at close range reduce the difficulty of attacks, including melee attacks by one to a minimum of zero. Uh, while you are prone, you can reroll any cover damage die you have. Major actions, you can assist another character. You can attack with either a melee or a ranged attack. You can command an NPC, all right? In which case you're using your charisma plus speech. Um, if the NPC is a person, charisma plus survival. If the NPC is an animal, intelligence plus science if the NPC is a robot. Again, I really like the 
the differentiation between the types of entities you're interacting with um, and, and the fact that you're using different skill sets and, um, and even different attributes in order to do that. You can defend, so you're focusing on protecting yourself, making an agility plus athletics test with a difficulty equal to your current defense. If you succeed, you add plus one to your defense. For two action points, you add an extra plus one to your defense. You can uh, administer first aid, which is intelligence plus the medicine test. You can um, you can pass on your round and so your or your turn, and you're going to pass your major action. You can rally. You grit your teeth, uh, catch your breath, and prepare yourself, making an endurance plus survival test with a difficulty of zero, and save any action points you generate. The GM may allow you to use a different ATT to uh, plus skill, uh, that's a tribute plus skill, for an action depending on how you describe it, such as charisma and speech to inspire your allies. You can ready, describe a situation you expect to occur, and choose a major action you will perform when it does. If that action occurs, before the start of your next turn, you may perform the major action immediately, interrupting other characters' actions as necessary. Um, yeah, so if you're, you know, if you describe, and I really like this aspect of it too, it keeps on coming back to the player and asking the player to be very descriptive of your actions um, because it may either affect the outcome or it may. Um, it may involve uh, changing that initiative uh, order uh, as long as your action wasn't the next one coming up anyway. Uh, sprint, you can move uh, movement action. You move up to two zones to anywhere within long range. Uh, test, in other words, you're performing a skill that counts as a major action during your turn as well. Action points in combat encounters, you can buy additional D20s. Um, that makes it uh, easier for you to have successes. You can obtain information, ask the game master a single question about the current situation based on your test. The GM will answer truthfully, but the answer might not be complete. Uh, take a, an additional action, a minor action, that's plus one AP. Uh, to do that, take an additional major action is plus two APs in order to do that. Uh, to do add extra damage, an extra damage die, it doesn't mean it automatically adds a plus one. Um, for every point of AP you spend, you get to roll an additional damage die. That's really pretty significant. When we get to damage, you'll see what I'm talking about. So making an attack. Choose a weapon and target. Select one weapon you are currently wielding. Then select a single character, creature, or object as the target. Um, you choose a hit location. You may choose to target a specific part of the uh, target creature or character. This increases the difficulty of the attack by one. So in other words, when they say increasing it by one, um, it's increasing the number of successes you need by one, not the die roll by one, all right? So you will have a target number that you need to reach. Let's say you need to reach a target number of 13, um, and you're rolling a d20 to make it. Adding a plus one to the difficulty is not going to make it where you have to roll a 14 in order to hit that target number of 13. What it's gonna do is, it's going to require that you need two successes on the two D20 rolls in order to hit the target. All right. Uh, so that means you need two 13s or higher in order to hit the target. That's what adjusting the difficulty of a task actually means here. Uh, attempting a test, a weapon, you're going to use strength plus your um, melee weapons. Test with a difficulty equal to your target's defense. Uh, ranged weapons is agility plus small guns, endurance plus big guns, or perception 
plus energy weapons. So once again, you have this differentiation. The type of ranged weapon you're using is going to use different um, attributes, you know, plus the specific skill used for those. Um, throwing weapons is perception plus explosives or agility plus throwing. Um, unarmed is strength plus unarmed. Determining hit location. If you passed your test, you rolled a d20 to hit location die to determine the part of the target you hit. Um, and I'll show you that chart real quick. Uh, inflicting damage, you roll the number of combat dice listed by the weapon's damage rating plus any bonuses from derived statistic or AP or ammo spent. Reduce the target's health points by the total rolled. Resistance, the target reduces the total damage inflicted by the damage resistance against that uh, attack's damage type on the hit location. Characters and creatures have different damage resistance for different types of damage, whether it be physical, energy, radiation, or poison. Reduce the ammunition. If you made a ranged attack, remove one shot of ammunition, plus any additional shots of ammunition spent during the attack. Uh, so yes, uh, management of your ammunition is very important in this game. Hit locations, so you have two sets of, um, of charts to use. For standard humanoids, you have the first one, uh, at, where you can hit head, torso, left arm, right arm, left leg, or right leg. Uh, creatures with other hit locations, if you have a quadruped, then you have head, torso, and then all four different legs. For a flying insect, you have the head to torso, left wing, right wing, and then all of the legs. Uh, possibly it doesn't really matter uh, significantly how many legs they actually have. Uh, ranged attacks within reach, and it gives you the various modifiers to your ranged attacks. If you're close, this weapon is most effective against targets within the same zone. Um, you know, the type of weapon that you're having is going to have a specific range that is its best usage. Uh, medium, this weapon is most effective against targets in an adjacent zone. Long is the weapon is most effective against targets two zones away. And extreme, this weapon is most effective against targets three or more zones away. An ex example here, a sculpt hunting rifle with a long range will add plus one to the difficulty of its attacks at medium range or extreme range and plus two to the difficulty of attacks at close range. A shotgun with close range adds plus one to the difficulty of the attacks at medium range, plus two at long range, and plus three extreme range. That really means that they need, like let's say a shotgun fighting at extreme range. Are uh, you using it to hit a target at extreme range? You will need plus three, plus three uh, effective hits. All right, in order to hit the one time, right? So if you have a, uh, if you need to hit a target number of a 14, well then you're going to need to hit that target or, or hit that roll, that target number four times, all right? Which means you're gonna have to roll, you know, most likely two, three, or four attack die uh, in, or action die in order to get there. Um, it's, it's a significant challenge uh, when you're increasing the difficulty, uh, you know, anytime. So you're always going to want to use a weapon in its most effective range. So the combat dice, and as I said, the um, it works differently than other systems, all right? And if you're familiar with the 2D20 system from Modiphius, from other game systems, this follows through um, the damage die. So it's a six-sided die. It has, you know, 
a 1 through 6, obviously. A 1 does 1 point of damage. It does 1 wound. A 2 does 2 points of damage. A 3 and 4 does nothing. A 5 does 1 point of damage, plus a damage effect is triggered. And a 6 does 1 point of damage, and then a damage effect triggered. Now, you might have a weapon where you're rolling 4 of these. So you can do any combination of damage and effect. All right. You could end up rolling four twos and you've done eight wound points of damage, which is a devastating attack. You might roll a combination of, you know, ones, fours, and sixes. And the number of fours is going to do nothing for you. The one, and let's say you rolled a one and a six, you're going to do two wound points of damage plus a damage effect is triggered. So a laser gun has a damage rating of four damage die with a, pier with a piercing of plus one damage effect. So when you, when you score a five or a six, you're going to do an additional wound of piercing damage when you use that weapon. It's it's a it's a really interesting, it's very fast and it's dynamic. It, you will you will learn this system very very quickly and you will see um, how spending those action points and everything to get additional damage die is actually uh, super effective in dealing out massive amounts of damage. You can increase damage, as I was explaining, by spending additional damage die and, and or action points. You can spend plus one to roll uh, in your damage dice pool. You can spend up to three to roll a three additional die in order to do that. And again, it's massive. Um, damage types. So you have physical damage. Um, unarmed attacks, blunt attacks, slashing, and stabbing on um, ballistics. You have energy, which is laser, plasma, and flame weapons. You have radiation, which is exposure to rads or nuclear weaponry. And you have poisons, which are toxins, chemicals, and creatures, things, and barbs. And all creatures uh, might have uh, different damage resistance uh, based on those various types of, uh, of damage types. Damage effects. <coughs> if you are firing a weapon and you get one of those damage triggers, um, you can end up doing a burst, which means you hit more than one target. Uh, breaking for each effect rolled, reduce the number of damage uh, die. A target's cover provides by it by one. Um, so actually, your specialty shot actually broke through their cover, and uh, you'll do um, you'll potentially do more damage. Persistent. If one or more effects are rolled, the target suffers the weapon's damage again at the end of their next and subsequent turns for a number of rounds equal to the number of effects rolled. All right, so that's like damage over time. A piercing, and then the amount, um, ignores the X points of target DR for each effect rolled, uh, where an X is the rating of this damage effect. Uh, so if you do piercing one, then you will, uh, you will ignore one damage uh, resistance of your target radioactive for every effect roll, the target suffers one point of radiation damage, um, which is pretty significant. Spread. For each effect rolled, your attack inflicts one additional hit on the target. Each additional hit inflicts half the damage rolled rounded down. Uh, that's like a walking hits kind of thing, you know, where you hit the target several times in that one attack. A stun. If one or more effects are rolled, the target cannot take their normal actions on their next turn. And Vicious. The attack inflicts plus one 
damage for each effect rolled. Uh, so if you have a weapon that's particularly vicious, um, that can deal a lot of wound points uh, in one hit. Radiation damage is applied differently than other types. Each point of radiation damage after reduction for the location's radiation DR reduces the character's maximum health points rather than their current health points. If a character's health point maximum is reduced below their current hit point, um, health point total, then their current HP are reduced as well. Radiation damage is only reduced by the target's radiation damage resistance according to the location hit. If the radiation wound uh, would affect the whole body like an environmental effect, then use the character or creature's lowest location radiation damage resistance. In all cases where a character would suffer radiation damage and another type of damage at the same time, resolve the radiation damage after any other damage types. Damage and injury. So here critical hits and injuries are done differently. And once again, I really like it because it, first you have to determine what body part is being hit and a critical hit isn't scored by, um, the quality of your hitting, it's a critical hit is determined by the number of damage in one strike you actually inflicted. So a critical hit occurs whenever a character suffers five or more damage in one hit after reductions from damage resistance, right? So um, a critical hit imposes an injury on the character which confers a penalty depending on the location of the hit. So an arm, um, you drop any object held in the hand and the arm is broken or otherwise unable to move. A leg, you immediately fall prone. As your leg gives out under your weight, you can no longer take the sprint action. Torso, you begin to bleed heavily at the end of each of your subsequent turns, you suffer two damage die. So that means you're gonna roll two die. It could do up to four points of damage. It could do other, um, you know, other effects as well. Uh, head, you are momentarily dazed and lose your normal actions in your next turn, though you may spend AP for extra actions as normal. Further, you cannot clearly, uh, you cannot see clearly and increase the difficulty of all your tests relying on vision by plus two. The effects last until the injury has received, uh, the injured has received medical attention. Dying. When your character is reduced to zero hit points, they suffer an injury to the location struck, then fall prone and start dying. If they suffer a critical hit and are reduced to zero, they suffer two injuries, one for the critical hit and one for being reduced to zero. While they are dying, they are unconscious, cannot recover HP and the first aid, uh, from the first aid action and cannot take any actions. Furthermore, at the start of each of your turns while you are dying, you must attempt an endurance plus survival test with a difficulty equal to the number of injuries they have and a complication range of 19 or 20. If you pass this test, you remain alive, but are still dying. If you fail, you die. All right. Um, if they suffer any damage while dying, they immediately gain one additional injury in addition to any injuries caused by another critical hit. So, when you, when you get in that situation, it's, it's a very, very fast escalating issue. Any additional damage you're taking is going to make it that much harder for you to survive. And finally, healing. I believe this is finally. Um, 
healing, healing actions in combat. You can take a cam, you can apply first aid or somebody else can apply first aid on you. Stabilizing dying is a separate action. Um, and anyone can do this. It requires an intelligence plus medicine uh, or endurance plus survival test to avoid death. Regaining health. You can, sure, uh, you can use the first aid action to heal a character's health. Passing an intelligence plus medicine will heal the number of hit points equal to the rank in the medicine skill. And an additional 1 HP for every AP you spend. You can only heal the AP, a, HP of a stable character, so they can't be dying currently. Treating an injury, you may attempt an intelligence plus medicine test to treat an injury sustained from a critical hit. Passing the test allows a patient to ignore the penalties of the injury. Using stim packs, uh, which is a chem, um, is a minor action, immediately recovers four HP or treats one injury. If the person, uh, if the person injected was dying, then they will stabilize immediately with first aid major action can be administered a stim pack. As part of that action, the patient gains plus four uh, HP immediately in addition to any other effects and the AP spent to heal additional health points uh, heals twice as much two HP per AP spent rather than just one. Robots cannot be healed from stim packs, but you can use robot repair kits for the same benefits outlined here. And so healing robots, you're going to use intelligence plus repair, and then it follows all of those same rules as uh, described. Long-term recovery, you have rest, and the rest will, uh, will heal injuries as well as recovering some hit points as well. Food and drink, uh, every time you consume something raw, uh, you roll a one damage when consuming irradiated food or drink, and if you roll an effect, you suffer one radiation damage, ignoring any DR from the equipment or armament. All right, um, medical attention. Uh, now this is really extended, you know, medical attention. Uh, that is going to certainly make your recovery that much more effective and rapid. <coughs> then we have environment, and I am going to um, get to environment and do this in a separate video. Uh, as I said, I wanted to try to keep this a little bit more concise and we're already pushing 33 minutes, which is farther than I was looking to go. So um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, remember to uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Uh, hit the alert button so you hear when uh, you know new drops happen. Um, comments if you've been playing with this system you know, anything they use to tweak the system, uh, I'm already thinking of, you know, just dice rolling, um, you know, the best way to c kind of get everything down into just, you know, one roll to do all of those actions. Now, that might be a lot of dice rolling at one time. Uh, so a dice tray will certainly be healthy in doing that, you know, helpful in doing that. But um, yeah, any, any comments that you want to make, uh, that is be much appreciative. And uh, as always, I thank you for joining. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. I look forward to seeing you on a gaming screen or at a convention sometime soon. My next convention is not until January, so I have quite a number of months uh, to get ready for it. Uh, and looking forward to uh, Philadelphia Area Game Expo. And, um, and I'm going to start preparing an adventure for Fallout RPG to uh, to be run at Rising Phoenix in April. So I am really getting ready to start running this game system. I'm going to run it in my home game first uh, with my core group of players, plus invite others to join in in either that session or 
um, supplement other sessions that I will be running. Uh, so I am looking to get into this game right now. And now that my first convention is behind me, I can now really start focusing on writing, um, writing a setting and, uh, you know, and adventures for Fallout RPG and then play testing them out and getting ready for uh, conventions of 2025 with the system. So you'll have a great day. Take care.